Welcome to class. Uh, this is Mr. Hawkins' class as usual. Uh, today we are going to be looking at a classic in children's literature, but just because it's children's literature doesn't mean you should just discount it, toss it aside. There are reasons why we are doing this. Um, the title of today's presentation, that, which mimics in some regard the title of the book that we're going to be looking at, is called You Can Read With Your Eyes Shut. Please, please don't by Mr. Hawkins. So let's jump into it then. Uh, why are we going to read something from actually Dr. Seuss or Theodore Seuss Gessel is his real name? Well, he's the most popular children's author of all time. Uh, he has six titles of his in the top 20 of all time published children's hardback books ever. He writ or wrote rather nearly 20 or nearly 50 books of which almost half of them are in the top 189 books sold all time. In order to be even on that list of books sold all time, you have to have sold a minimum of 750,000 copies. Okay. If you want to see the full list, I put the link there. It's found at publishersweekly.com. And the book that we're going to be looking at today is I Can Read With My Eyes Shut by Dr. Seuss. It was first published in 1978. This book is older than I am. It's older than you are. It might be older than your parents. Uh, who knows? Yeah, either way, it's ranked 58th all time. There's over 2,139,084 copies in circulation in the world. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's outdated. Uh, it can be just as relevant today as the day it was published. I would argue, if anything, it might be more needed in the day and age in which we live in. Why take time reading this? Well, besides the fact that the author is one of the greatest of all time, uh, and you're saying to yourself, but I'm in a sophomore English class. Isn't this kid stuff? Well, text complexity, to me, it's about more than lexile levels. Lexile levels to me are just vocab and uh, you know how difficult it is uh, to understand a word. I think it's about the questions that you can ask of a text. You know, yeah, this may be a children's book, but if you can ask very profound questions, you could walk away with an understanding that is beyond what a child can grasp. And if you can do the thing which is even harder, which is combine two of such elements so that a child can understand something that is complex, then you're one of the greatest writers of all time. Uh, you could be the smartest person in the room, but if no one else in the room can understand you, then you're really not that smart. Uh, you know, those that understand and win arguments are those that can bring people in and not push people out for their cause. Um, so uh, while we go about reading, it's important to also understand that there's such a concept as first reading versus second reading. Now, first reading is where you go through and obviously you just read it for the first time. Uh, we mean by that that you're not trying to understand anything more than just the text itself. You're trying to familiarize yourself with it. You're trying to not analyze it yet. You're just trying to know the beginning, the middle and end, so to speak. Uh, and then once we transition into a second reading or a close reading, then we can start looking at what might be implied in a text. We can start to look at maybe symbolism or other sort of uh, conventions that are going on in the, at play. Um, if we were to use maybe an analogy here, reading uh, can kind of be like eating food, right? You eat a certain food and you say to yourself, wow, this has a certain taste to it that might either be bitter or sweet. And after you taste it, you start to say to yourself, okay, well, what are the ingredients? Why is it that I'm tasting this or having this sort of experience with this food, right? The same can be said with the written word, right? You read something and then you have a reaction to it. And then you have to figure out what were the conventions? What were the things that the author did purposefully that made it so I received the information in this way? Or what about my own experience informs me in the reading, okay? With that in mind, we'll jump into the first reading, uh, and I'll just read you through this short children's classic, okay? Um, 
This book was originally dedicated towards uh, Dr. Seuss's ophthalmologist or eye doctor, uh, David Worthen. So keep that in mind. We'll jump into this classic, classic tale. I can read in red. I can read in blue. I can read in pickle color too. I can read in bed and in purple and in brown. I can read in a circle and upside down. I can read with my left eye. I can read with my right. I can read Mississippi with my eyes shut tight. Mississippi. Mississippi, Indianapolis, and hallelujah too. I can read them with my eyes shut. That is very hard to do. But it's bad for my hat and makes my eyebrows get red hot. So, reading with my eyes shut, I don't do an awful lot. And when I keep them open, I can read with much more speed. You have to be a speedy reader, because there's so, so much to read. You can read about trees, and bees, and knees, and knees on trees, and bees on threes. You can read about anchors, and all about ants. You can read about ankles, and crocodile pants. You can read about hoses, and how to smell roses, and what you should do about owls on noses. Young cat, if you keep your eyes open enough, oh, the stuff you will learn, the most wonderful stuff. You'll learn about fish bones and wish bones. You'll learn about trombones, too. You'll learn about Jake, the pillow snake, and all about Fufu, the snoo. You can learn about ice. You can learn about mice. Mice on ice and ice on mice. You can learn about the price of ice. Nice ice for sale. Ten cents a pail. You can learn about sad and glad and mad. There are so many things you can learn about, but you'll miss the best things if you keep your eyes shut. The more that you read, the more things you will know. The more that you learn, the more places you'll go. You might learn a way to earn a few dollars or how to make donuts or kangaroo collars. You can learn to read music and play a hutzut if you keep your eyes open, but not with them shut. If you read with your eyes shut, you're likely to find that the place where you're going is far, far behind. So that's why I tell you to keep your eyes wide. Keep them wide open at least on one side. That's it. End of the first reading. Now, on the second, third, fourth reading of a book, of a text, we analyze. Now, what do we mean when we use this word analyze? Right? Well, analyze could mean you question something. What does it mean and what does it imply? Are those two things the same or are they different? Right? Is there any symbolism here? Or is something supposed to signify something else and mean something more and grander? Right? Does the author background make a difference when reading a text? So if you learn about Dr. Seuss's life and understand that he actually made cartoons that were propaganda during World War II, how does that change your reading of a book that he writes in 1978? Should it, could it make a difference in how you interpret him, right? If you learn about his own personal life, does that enter into the text and does that sway the way in which he presents information? It could. That is called biographical literary analysis. You could also ask, how does the text deal with issues of class or wealth, right? This would be what we would call a Marxist literary analysis. Okay, are people in positions of power the same people that have money? Do they use that money to oppress people, right? Uh, you could also analyze, and it can mean different things if you were to say, how does the author treat male and female characters? Does he reinforce or reject stereotypes? This would be what we would look into in regards to feminist literary analysis. Okay, How does the author treat races within a work? This would be critical race theory. Is this story didactic or moralistic? Is there some sort of teaching component as to how to make someone a better person? Right? There's also reader response theory. How does your own experience change the reading? You can also look to a historical literary analysis by saying, 
what was going on in the time period of 1978, which would cause the author to maybe write what he wrote. Each of these different lenses, we can say, right, are a different way of viewing the text. And we will make use of this for different stories and different ways of analyzing and making arguments about uh, the author's intent or what the book says as a whole. Okay? Um, as for now, we're going to look at my own sort of take and analysis on this. Okay? Um, before we do that, it's important to understand the dangers of reading with your eyes shut, which I think is maybe the central message and theme and idea of this work, right? Ethnocentrism is a belief that your interpretation of the world is exactly as it is, that you are right and no one else is. Right? You accept only that which you agree with and automatically toss away anything that anyone says or does which disagrees with you. In other words, you stop yourself from learning. You're basically prideful and can't learn anything. Why would somebody do this? Well, it's easier to stay where you are than critically consider and perhaps change or learn or say that perhaps you weren't right, that you were wrong. Uh, that may be the most single difficult thing for most people, uh, ironically and sadly, is to say you know, those few words of, I'm wrong or I'm sorry, which in our current day and age, we need so much of is the ability of people to just admit, maybe they didn't have all the information. Maybe their first instinct wasn't the right instinct. Okay. Um, a school year is 180 days of opportunity. You get 180 at bats, if you will, and you can choose to swing for the fences or you can choose not to participate. If you're ethnocentric, you will learn zero out of 180 days. What a terrible way to shortchange yourself and the experience of others um, because your education doesn't just affect you, it affects all people that you interact with. It affects the people that are your friends and it affects the way that they respond and react to issues. Um, if you are humble and say maybe there is something I could learn or haven't considered, then maybe you do learn. If you approach each day like that, then perhaps you'll learn 180 days in a row. If you're open to learning, it may still confirm what you thought originally, or it may not. Either way, at least you gave yourself the opportunity to be challenged, okay? That is a big takeaway. I'm not saying that you have to change your mind on any of these issues that eventually we will discuss. You have the right to make up your own mind. But if you don't acknowledge that there is another side, if you don't acknowledge that there are various reasons that people have for holding an opposing viewpoint, then you've shortchanged yourself and you've shortchanged other people. Right. So let's take a second look and a third look or more because maybe Dr. Seuss is more than a children's author. Maybe just maybe there are some deep ideas presented in this children's book from 1978. Maybe you're guilty of putting people, ideas, and issues into boxes. Maybe automatically casting someone or something aside is very dangerous. Maybe our news is reported with eyes shut sometimes. Maybe those who post on social media do it with eyes closed. Maybe this book is more timely than ever. Just because I come to these conclusions doesn't mean you have to come to the same conclusions. Doesn't mean you have to agree with me. Doesn't mean that I am right. Doesn't mean a whole lot, really. It's just the way I read and interpret and understand this book. But hopefully, it does mean you can have something to discuss and consider. I've been in plenty of classes. I was once a student too, and I sat in English classes and I had teachers and they would sit up and they would spread forth their various political views. And if you did not agree with them, then you could guarantee that perhaps in some small way in regard, or even in a major way in regard, it was gonna affect your grade at the end of the day. Right? Which I think is pretty wrong, okay? You have your opinions, you have your views, 
Uh, you just need to be able to express them. I will be able to argue both sides of each argument as we go forward in this class. I will be able to acknowledge that there are various issues present. Right? That is what is really important to me. Do I care if you stand on one side versus the other at the end of the day? Not really. Uh, you know, but I do, do care that you are able to articulate and acknowledge with a great de deal of, you know, sincerity, the viewpoints that the other side has and why they hold those views. Okay, because if you just discount that oh, they're the other side, this, that, the other, and put a label associated to them and do not give them the time of day and treat their argument as disposable, then you're treating them as disposable. And that is a dangerous precedent, no matter which side of the argument you are on. Okay? So let's look at some of my musings from a second reading. Okay? Um, this first page, right? where it's talking about I can see in red, I can see in blue, I can see in pickle color too. Well, red could mean a lot of things or it could mean nothing, right? Maybe it presents or represents the Republican Party. Maybe it represents the Communist Party. Maybe it's just the color red, who cares, right? Do I think that there was some grand scheme and design in place by Dr. Seuss as he's doing this? I don't know, probably not, right? But for the sake of argument, right? I think that in terms of keeping your eyes shut, right? you can look at things in terms of how the Republican Party looks at something, right? Um, and on the flip side with the blue, right? Blue could mean a lot of things, right? Maybe it represents the Democratic Party. Maybe it represents a mood, a feeling. Maybe it's just the color blue, right? Uh, because he's gonna need a rhyme, right? I can read in red, I can read in blue, I can read in pickle color two. Blue and two, rhyme goes together, right? He's using different colors. Kids need to understand those as a young kid. So why not have different colors? Okay. Um, but either way, how you choose to interpret or refuse to interpret can put you in quite a pickle, right? I mean, again, interpretation can be tricky. You could believe that something that no one else believes in a text, but if you have supporting evidence and reasoning, that can point you back to the uh, back to your arguments that will be uh, much greater, right? Um, there are various reasons why people on the Democratic Party feel the way that they do about certain issues. There are various reasons why Republicans feel a certain way about uh, certain issues. But n being able to only just label and say, well, oh, they're the liberal news media, or oh, it's Fox News, or oh, it's whatever, right? Throwing something completely aside uh, may not be the best thing in the world, right? Uh, there are definite reasons why people do what they do. Um, you know, the other thing I like about this book is that it shows that reading can happen anywhere. And also in this picture, if you see, you know, the person that's reading in bed, the larger cat, the young cat is always in this story following what the larger cat is doing, right? Little kids, people in general are impressionable. Whatever the person they're looking up to looks at may in any, many instances be the way that they look at and feel about an issue, okay? Uh, many off, many kids adopt the attitudes and behaviors of the adults that they live with, right? It's either that or they completely reject them. You know, they either go against and define themselves by saying, I'm not like you, mom, dad, or parent, or guardian, or whoever. Or they come to adopt a lot of the same political views and ideologies and understandings because that's the way that their parents view and talk about the issues, right? Um, you know, the next, I guess, bullet point down, you know, reading in purple, brown, black, or white. I mean, you could read things differently based upon your race, based upon how you view the world. You could think life is as clear and different as things being black and white. Or you may see that there is much more complication to a bunch of issues, that there's a lot of gray area out there. Finally, the reading in circles, you know, it may mean that sometimes words are twisted to fit whatever purpose people want. You know, that's the way I, I see it. You know, uh, in politics, all, this happens all the time. Twisting somebody's words to mean something that was opposite of what was intended. Um, you know, and sometimes you have to say, well, what was the context behind it? And other times you have to say that was the context. They did say those things. There's no other way to interpret this, right? Um, but oftentimes words can be fashioned in any way that people see fit, which is a dangerous, dangerous precedent, right? Um, 
again, this idea of seeing something from the left or seeing it from the right, you know, these are you know, heavy political terms because seeing something from the left could mean the Democratic, seeing from the right could be Republican. They could be all looking at the same thing, but they come to very different conclusions, right? Um, and finally, uh, you know, the cat can read with his eyes shut to the world and live off of what they have memorized, but what good does that do? Walking about as if one is blind. This is no way to live. It doesn't enhance further or future learning by shutting yourself off to, to the world around you. Um, because reading with one's eyes shut is dangerous. When the cat reads with his eyes shut, it makes his, quote, eyebrows get red hot. Well, maybe when reading something from your own point of view, you see someone argue against it and you can feel defensive. You can feel angry, you can be hot under the collar, you can personalize words and ideas, but you shouldn't uh, because it's okay to have different points of view. Reading with your eyes shut doesn't allow you the opportunity to see so much more to the argument, that, to life and to what may be discovered both in the world and inside yourself, okay? Um, there is so, so much to read. And so what are you reading? If your life consists of only text messages and status updates, you're living below your privileges. You're literate. You have the ability to read, right? You have the power to reason and read, and so read much more than you are so that you can reason all the more. The more that you read, the more reasonable you will become. The less you read, the more ignorant and unreasonable you will become. So read, read, read. Reading may happen individually, but it is also a communal experience. The cat in the hat that is in the larger cat here and the younger cat are looking at the same book, but they live different lives and will see different things in the book. That is not terrible, that is awesome. You have two books in one, virtually. You have the book as viewed by the older cat and the book as viewed by the younger cat. There will be things that both see that the other does not. And therefore, if they talk to each other, they can help the other learn or notice something. That is awesome. Right? Who cares about what you read about? Well, you should, right? The next three pages that Dr. Seuss gives here are towards different random things that could be read about. It doesn't matter what you read, but it should be something that you enjoy or are challenged by. If you like comics, read comics. If you like adventure stories, read adventure stories. If you like mystery and suspense, then go for it, right? School mandates that certain books be read, but that is not the end-all and be-all of literature. There are millions of books. And we are asking you to consider a few within the parameters of education. If you hate the few we choose, don't hate all books and all reading. That would be foolish, okay? Eventually, you will read all that you like, but you'll want to venture outside of what you like and maybe explore other books, other tastes, other ideas. This is great. This is learning that happens without a teacher presenting or trying to guide you to certain conclusions. You get to navigate the world of literature and most of it will be done without a teacher there, which should excite you. If you don't like what you're reading, you should ask, why is that so? Are you not allowing yourself to grow or does the book simply just not suit your tastes at this time, right? You can revisit books later and maybe you will have changed and it won't have been the book that was different. It will be you and your experiences. This is the linchpin, I think, moment in the story, right? Where he, the cat is talking and leading the way and has all these books and going up and exploring new places and tosses back a book to one that is eager to learn and says, but if you keep your eyes open enough, oh, the stuff you will learn, the most wonderful stuff. As we've explained, learning is not guaranteed. Why doesn't learning happen? You can blame it on teachers, you can blame it on the pandemic, you can blame it on anything, but if you do not learn, it is likely that you are the one to blame at the end of the day. In the words of Nacho Libre, you are the gatekeeper to your own destiny. So, if you keep your eyes open, if, that word is so critical, it's not guaranteed, it's just if. If you keep your eyes open, and your mind open and your heart open to what you could learn, then you will learn the most wonderful stuff. You will learn things that challenge you, that shape you, that change you, and allow you to understand why the world moves as it does. You can see, view, discern, and explain a bunch of phenomenon, phenomenon around you. 
This picture also shows the power of where you go and others follow. What you choose to learn about lets others learn as well. Your kids in the future that you may have one day, or your friends that you currently have, will mimic you. They'll take social cues from you. They'll talk about certain things because you talk about those same things. They will want to be like you, which is an awesome power. So what is it that you are reading? What is it that you are saying? Why is it that you're engaging in certain conversations and not others, right? Um, finally, you know, much of what is assumed in your educational contract is that you show up and gain knowledge and skills that will allow you to showcase those skills and competencies such that you will be employable. You know, through reading and understanding, you can make some money. You can learn how money dictates social policies, politics, and daily decisions. There are cold hard facts of life, and sadly, much of people's lives revolve around obtaining and spending money. There are business ventures of all kinds. There is money in ice, believe it or not. There is money in donuts, or the latest fashion trend. What does this have to do with English? There are advertisements using ethos, pathos, and logos. There are politics at work and the use of management of money by either private business or government use. We communicate with our words and how we choose to arrange them can make all the difference in terms of how we are perceived. Uh, the motions of reading are real. Dr. Seuss only lists those things that make someone feel either sad, glad, or mad. Oftentimes in argument, argumentative or expository writing, there are those moments when you will read something and feel one of those emotions. And it is okay to feel sad, to feel glad, to feel mad. These are your emotions and you get to feel them. Just because something angers you doesn't mean that you should avoid reading on. Just because you find something upsetting doesn't mean that all is lost. It doesn't mean that you now have license to shut your eyes and quit considering the other side. A better way of reading in this moment of discontent is deciding and discerning why it is that you feel this way. What is it about the topic and how you read about it that you now feel upset? You've got to get to the core of the problem and consider what is it that is so troubling. Put words to it, write about it, journal it out, respond to it, let the words and ideas work inside of you. You can go very real places because of what you know or what you can do. Okay. By virtue of me, in my own experience, just running faster than other human beings, as silly and as simple as that is, I was able to travel around the United States. I was able to get a scholarship to college. I was able to earn an education. The same can be said of learning. If you keep on reading, keep on opening up your mind to the possibilities of letting an argument continue, then you'll find you and others can go places. If we expect problems to get better, we need to go there together. We can't sit on our side, whatever side that may be, and close our eyes and minds and hearts to those who hold opposing views. It is called compromise. It is not a dirty word. It is not a word that you're going to hear from politicians and that they're familiar with, but it is one that the most hope-filled words out there. You can go places together. All of us can, as a society, as a community, and even as a country. Okay. If you keep your eyes open, you can learn to play some wonderful music in Dr. Seuss's words, a hutza, this made-up instrument, right? But I'm here to say that you can learn to write. You can learn to communicate effectively. You can learn how to be convincing in your arguments. You can write masterpieces of literature. You can drop lines and lyrics like the Beatles, Eminem, or anyone else that is an influencer in this world. You can unearth a poem inside of you. You can call out fear mongering and display an understanding of logical fallacies. There is so much that you can do to enhance the world around you and make it a better place if you keep your eyes open. When I say keep your eyes open, I mean don't be shackled to your own experience. Realize that other people live vastly different lives than you, and that is something to learn from. Stand in their shoes. See life as they see it. Understand where they are coming from. 
you may still not agree with someone at the end of standing in their shoes, but at least you have tried. There is something to be said for lear from learning that experience alone. If reading with your eyes shut leads you to places that are far, far behind, then perhaps this is a way of saying that history repeats itself. Do we want to live in a world where ignorance rules, where might is right, where fear mongering dictates policy? Do we want to revisit oppression? How do atrocities occur in any era? By people keeping their eyes shut. Consider, for example, the number of homeless people in the world. This is a problem that we as a society keep our eyes shut to. The same can be said of sex trafficking, the war on drugs, starvation, or any of a host of issues that the world faces. Even the best and brightest in the world keep their eyes shut. How many degrees from Ivy League schools are given every year? And yet, still, these same problems persist. When money is the end goal, everyone becomes expendable. The education of our motivations ought to be something that we should consider going forward. Finally, if you, even if you don't change your opinion, even if you decide ultimately to stay where you originally started, that's fine. So long as you truly allow yourself to look at issues with both eyes wide open. We live in a world where there are, at the very least, two sides to every issue, often more. People who stand on one side feel that they are right, sane, responsible people, and that the other side don't see it as it is. Well, guess what? The other side feels the exact same. They feel that they are the ones that are right, sane, reasonable people, and that the other side just doesn't get it. You can pick any issue, gun rights, abortion, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, pro-Trumpers, Democrats, Republicans, and the list can go on and on and on and on. Recognize and know that most people are doing the best that they can with what they know. There are trolls out there. They live on the internet and hide behind anonymity, at least some of them. Don't be a troll. Don't showcase ignorance and treat it as a virtue or a badge of honor. So your assignment now is to pick an issue or topic or moment where you feel you have seen someone act as if they were living with their eyes shut. You're going to write about the event. Explain what the issue, topic, or moment was like and how you knew that someone was choosing not to see the other point of view. I'm going to provide my own example that showcases how to do this and what length, roughly, uh, your writing should be. It can be longer. I prefer it not to be shorter. So it can be shorter than what I've done. I've done about two paragraphs worth. Um, so you got to aim for that sort of uh, length. It's set up with MLA format, which is Times New Roman, size 12 font, double spaced. Uh, don't mess with the margins to try to make it different. You know, as an English teacher, you can always see those things. Um, but anyway, you can see my example. Uh, where I pretend to be a student and write a paper that is on Teams. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me at phawkins at psd1.org. Uh, always feel free to reach out to me at any time if you have any questions whatsoever about any sort of assignment that we're posting here. And yeah, that should be it.